They said, Danik's speaking today, so we need to turn the mic up. Now y'all can all hear me today. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Danik. For anyone that doesn't know me, I think I know almost everybody here. And this is my wife, Jackie. She's joining me today. And we're elders here at the church. So, um, I guess I'd like to preface with saying that this is the most images and the most variety of verses spread from the whole Bible that I've ever shared in a message. So there's a lot of time where I may be talking where you won't be looking at me, but you'll be looking at the screen, which is totally fine. Um, and also, I asked my wife maybe about three or four weeks ago, I said, hey, I think you're supposed to give the message with me. She's like, really? Because she's working on her final. She completed her program for schooling. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And the next step, check. Now she just, check, check. So I'll, now she has to just pass her board exams so, and find a job. But that will happen, the board exams at least, will happen at the end of the month. So anyways, as she came out of that, it's been a couple weeks since her finals week, and she's like, what are you going to speak on? I said, I'll give you the verses, and you speak what the Lord tells you. So uh, she's like, I don't like that. I'm like, <laughs> it's great. It's great whenever uh, you haven't read my notes, and you start talking about everything that I was going to say. So it's just it's Holy Spirit confirmation. So anyways. I'm just going to pray us in. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this time, Lord. And we just open our hearts right now in this time, God, to receive the word that you're, that you're wanting to speak to our hearts, God. I just ask for fertile soil in this house today and for a seed to be planted, God. Help us to communicate well. And uh, we love you, Jesus. We ask all this in your name. Amen. So for several weeks... Um, the Lord's been showing me the same thing whenever I pray over our church. Same thing, same vision, over and over again. And um, it's not really uncommon that this happens, one, that I get a vision, or that I get visions when I pray for our church. But um, there was a season pre-COVID where the Lord was always showing me that, that Jesus was doing something. He's like sweeping the floors in our old building or... He was building something. He was cleaning something. It was the same thing for months and months and months. The Lord's just cleaning up, cleaning house. And then one day, the vision changed. And not everybody has been to our old property, but where we used to be, we were in the woods in this little bitty hidden space. And the Lord showed me that there was a huge foundation that, that Jesus had just finished building. It was like 10 feet thick like the size of a football field. And it was, it was big. And I was like, wow, Lord, like, okay, what does this mean? And so the next thing he showed me in the vision was the elders of our church. He had called all of us to come up onto the foundation and be pillars kind of on the outside of the foundation. And so we, we all took our place in the vision and I started to look at the body, and the Lord said, now everybody else in the body is going to be every other part of this building that I'm constructing. And so as I, as I looked out in the vision, I'm, I'm standing as a pillar on that foundation, and as I looked out, the faces of everyone, they were like disappoint, disappointed, like disenfranchised, like, mm, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. And I was, I was very saddened. Like, and it, we were not in a place in our church at that time, but I'm looking at it, I'm like, come on, like, this is what God wants for us. Like, you don't want this? And people just started to turn around and walk the other way. And there were very, very few people left in the vision. And um, so from there, I was like, Lord, did I just hear this wrong? Am I not like, is this my mind? And the Lord's like, no you're going to find out what all this means. So, so anyways, um, actually in my prophetic journey, I find that sometimes when the Lord shows you something, it's sometimes for now, 
Sometimes it's for what was in the past, and sometimes it's for what will be in the future. And that vision was something for the future. So today I want to start in Exodus 25. We're going to look at the tabernacle. And uh, I have a lot at the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And I've had a lot of confirmations in the last month that this is what the Lord wanted to talk about. Even YouTube videos that pop up that certain people didn't send me, Tom, also popped up like, oh, I need to send this to Tom too because I didn't look for this. It just popped up. But uh, let's go to Exodus 25, verse 8. It says, let them make me, this is God talking to Moses on the mountain. He said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And you shall make it according to all that I show you. The pattern of the tabernacle or dwelling and the pattern of all the furniture of it. So Josh, if you could pull up that big picture, that one, yes. So anytime I have images that I show up here, I did not create them. I stole them from the internet. I have a job that is not at this church and two small children. It takes a lot of time. So I just thank Jesus that there's other people with, other people with time and skills to make something nice looking like this. So anyways, um, so this is the, the tabernacle that was what God had had them create in the desert. And um, this was during their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. So all the instructions and everything that he told them to build all happened out in basically the middle of nowhere. So we got, uh, we have kind of this, this outer courts area here. We have an altar for sacrifices. Uh, uh, it says a brazen laver for washing. And then there's the, the holy place over here, which is the dwelling. And so I kind of want you to have some, some visuals as I go through some of this today. But this is the holy place. And this is like, uh, this is the dwelling. This is the holy place here. Here's the veil that we were singing about earlier today in uh, one of those songs. Which one was it, Kendall? All hail King Jesus. And then the most holy place or the holy of holies was behind the veil. And that's where God's presence was. We'll go into more of that as we chat today. But I wanted to give you a visual because we're going to talk about a lot of this in the first part of the message. So God had a specific plan of what he wanted that to look like, who would gain access, where, um, and really start outlining the concept of who he is, one, one aspect of who he is. Um, but really, he just wanted to be in the midst of his people. And uh, in order to do that, they had to create a place for him to rest and to reside. So the first instruction that the Lord gave regarding this tabernacle was an offering of materials. He asked Moses to tell all of the uh, Israelites, he had the long list and all of this. You could probably have like half a year's worth of messages over this, and I'm just going extremely high level and focusing on one point today. Um, but he asked for all the materials to build all of this, create all of the clothing, everything that they would need. And that was the first thing that he asked of, of God's people. And then the first thing that he, that he told Moses that, uh, as to how to construct was the Ark of the Covenant. And in the version that I'm reading today, it calls it the Ark of the Testimony. But the Ark of the Covenant is where... You can pull that up, Josh, if you want. The Ark of the, the, Ark of the Covenant is where, in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, where God's presence actually dwelled. And it was a large box that they created. It was overlaid in gold. And uh, in the middle between these angels was the mercy seat. And so they would perform these sacrifices, and then the blood from the sacrifices would go onto that, that mercy seat. And only the high priest could go into that space. No one else. God, but nobody else. So essentially, to make it real simple, God just wanted a place where he could be with his people, and this was his method. So the next item, do you have anything to say? Do you have anything to say? No? 
The next item and instructions given for, for the furnishings were everything that was in the holy place, almost everything. The first item was the table of showbread, and I have a picture of that too. Somewhere, the table of showbread. And the other dishes, vessel, vessels used for worship. Um, God told them that this bread should always be on the table before him in that holy place. And some biblical scholars have stated that this was basically like the center of union and communion, which I didn't realize we were going to do communion today when I started making this, uh, creating this message. But it was basically the center of union and communion for the priestly family. And God had instructed them to eat this bread, the priest, in the holy place at that table. Um, one scholar said that bread is basically represent, representative of sustenance and a reminder that God will sustain his people. Also, the bread and the entire process of its being created was a foretelling of Christ's sacrifice that would happen in the future. So, one aspect is of all this, you could just think of, think of this, that God wanted to remind us or demonstrate his character and foretell of Jesus' sacrifice to come. The next picture is the golden lampstand, which is made of pure gold. Um, again, anything in the holy place or the holy of holies was either pure gold or it was overlaid in gold. Um, and one interesting thing is that most of these things, if not all of them, had rings on the four corners of them for poles to be threaded through so that they could be carried as they travel through the desert. So the instructions for the golden lampstand, it was to be made of pure gold, um, and God gave specific details of the design of the lamp the lampstand. There is one scholar that I I read what he said about this, which really stood out to me. Dr. J. Vernon McGee, he stated that one technical point about the lampstand is of interest. He says, it was a light holder. He said the olive oil lamps were placed on the lampstand and the lampstand supported the flame. But the flame revealed the beauties of the golden lampstand. So they were like all these like ornate, like how they created, it wasn't just gold. It had like beautiful like shapes and things that were part of it. A lot of this is probably like, you could find somebody who's well studied up on all the symbolism of all of this. I'm not that person, but I'm sure somebody exists out there. Um, but he says the olive oil lamp is a scriptural symbol of the Holy Spirit. And he says the analogy is striking. He says, Christ sent the Holy Spirit into the world and he supports the Holy Spirit in his work. But the Holy Spirit takes the things of Christ and reveals them unto believers. He says, as the olive oil lamps were supported by the lampstand, and they in turn reveal the beauties thus Christ found in the foundation and support for the work of the Holy Spirit. But in turn, the Holy Spirit reveals the things of Christ. So if, you, if we go back to that picture, Josh, of the, the big picture, not that picture, the other big picture of everything, that one, yes, thanks. Um, if we go back to this space, like there wasn't a hole in the roof here. This hole in the roof is just for us to be able to see what was inside, but this place would have been dark, you know. It's a structure, they don't have electricity back then. And that, la that lamp stand is really what's gonna light up everything inside. So God wanted to shed light on the holy place. Is everybody tracking? Yes. It seems a little, it's a lot of information in a short period of time, I know. So the next item itself was, again, the dwelling where everything was housed, everything under that brown maroon tent. And it was basically like curtains that enclosed that space. Let's go to Exodus 26, verse 31 says, and make a veil of blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen, skillfully worked with cherubim on it, 
You shall hang it on four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold, with gold hooks on four sockets of silver. You shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony into place within the veil. And the veil, the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy place, or the holy of holies. And you shall put the, you shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And you shall set the table for showbread outside the veil in the holy place on the north side and the lamp on the opposite side of the table on the south side of the tabernacle. So when you read through these passages, the Lord is very specific about every detail. Um, you know, again, the, the veil was the delineation of the holy place from the most holy place or holy of holies. And God didn't just say, you know, once you create this stuff, just generically throw it in there wherever you think it's appropriate. No, he had specific places he wanted to put those furnishings. Recently, someone broke the iPad that I'm using today, shattered the screen, like enough to like, if you're going to swipe your finger, you'll slice your finger open. It was not me. It was not my children. It's my wife. She didn't know that I was going to say this, but anyways, so in lieu of us taking our iPad somewhere to be fixed for half the cost of a new iPad, we bought the $30 Amazon do-it-yourself replacement, which is prudent, yes. Um, however, it's not very easy to change the iPad screen. I'm just going to throw that out there. That's not a word from the Lord. That's just a word of wisdom from both of us. Um, the company, of course, that made this was from, is a Chinese company, like everything. And uh, they had a YouTube video and a link for that for you to be able to, like, watch the step-by-step -step and make it easy for you. And so we watched it, and it's like a minute and a half. I'm like, this? Man, this must be really easy. A minute and a half video? We're watching it. It's just kind of like a general overview of how to do it and we're like i'm trying like my personality i'm like i'm just gonna get this task done doesn't matter how if it's like partially right or wrong let's just get it done and jackie's like wait it's because this is like her ipad she's like wait we've got to watch we got to find somewhere that's going to show us exactly the right way to do this so i'm like tapping my foot like all right let's find this quick i just want to be done with this and uh so she finds another youtube video which i'm glad she did because this guy was very thorough. He even highlighted certain things that if you do it wrong, then your iPad's not going to work anymore. Like, you won't be able to turn it on or the, your thumbprint and all that stuff won't work. And, uh, and I was glad because at that point, I had all these tiny, tiny screws that you can barely see with your eyes um, in my hand. And I'm like, all right, I really don't want to break this. It, it certainly would have been cheaper to have someone else replace this than buy another one altogether. But fortunately, we were, uh, after about two hours of time, we were able to get the iPad working. And obviously, today, my notes are on it. So praise the Lord. But uh, I say all that because proper instructions are very important for a desired outcome. And I'm not really one, again, to try to read all the instructions. If I buy something from Ikea, I'm gonna mess it up probably and waste more time than I would have if I read, would have read the instructions to begin with, but that's just unfortunately how I'm wired. Sometimes it's bad, maybe sometimes it's good. You have any like rebuttal there about breaking your iPad or anything? No, okay. So our church is in the seventh to eighth year of its existence, and uh, that vision that I had that I was telling you about with the foundation, that was about year four or five. And uh, that's when the Lord started to kind of put us on the track where we are now and where we're headed to. Um, he started to ask the elders to begin to wrestle with our own identity and who God's called us to be as a ministry and as a church. So Josh, if you could pull up pull up our identity statement. The Refuge is a community rooted in the love of God and dedicated to personal freedom. 
sons and daughters find this freedom through transformation in his presence to impact the world. So as the elders, we began to ask ourselves, who are we? Not individually, but us as a collective. And um, so we started looking at the work that God had done through the ministry, through our church up to that point. We looked at what he was doing, and we began to look at what God was going to do. And um, the simplest form of our mission statement is one word, transformation. And um, so that's, from that point forward, that's what God began to speak over as our identity and destiny over us as a community. Proverbs 29, 18, it's not up there, but it's, it just states that where there's no vision, the people perish, and that's the season where God really began to envision us for where we are at today and where we're going. And I think for myself, to no surprise for you guys, in the first four years, the Lord has shown me plenty of prophetic things, give me visions, all kinds of stuff, but in my personality, there wasn't a whole lot of asking the Lord, like, all right, Lord, what are the directions to how to get there? It's just kind of like barreling through, and uh, the Lord said, hold up. We have, I have a specific way for this to be done. And then, of course, you know, the pandemic happened soon thereafter, and uh, everybody kind of stopped and started reevaluating what they were doing, so... But the one thing the Lord told us in that season was that the old model is not going to work. It's not going to work. I mean, you, if, if you've been here for long, or even if this is your first time, I'm not the pastor of this church, and you have to come probably seven or eight weeks in a row before you hear the pastor speak, because there's so many people that God has entrusted his word to, to share, and uh, to encourage and, and teach the body here which is what God wants. So back to my vision of the 10-foot foundation. The next thing that happened, oh, I think I already talked about this. I'll skip forward. No, what I did want to say was I wanted to highlight in my vision that I had that Jesus, the only thing that he did was build that huge foundation. And what I've found to be the coolest thing about that is the fact that really he's given us a lot of freedom as to how the rest of the structure is going to look. Like he, he, he had the calling on the elders for us to be, you know, pillars of support, but everything else is going to look like whoever comes alongside and builds alongside with us in this ministry because he likes to co-create with us. And what God has for our church is for his DNA to become intertwined with the DNA of us individually and us as our church. A few weeks ago, the Lord was speaking to me in one of our staff prayer meetings, and he said the words, I can do a lot with very little. And back in that season, the more we began to walk out what God was calling us to do and declaring what he was saying over us, we became littler and littler and littler. <laughs> Those people began to walk out the doors and turn their backs, just like I saw in the vision. And uh, in spite of all that, the Lord still has had his way. We are where we're at today. Um, but there's still, more, there's still more for us to go. All right, let's jump back to the, the, to the tabernacle. So the next instructions were how to construct the courts surrounding the holy place. And one thing when we were reading through all of these books or these chapters in, in Exodus, which is like a lot of chapters of directions, and it, it really required some testing of my patience to read through all of this because I'm not a big directions person, reminding you. But... Uh, I think the, the most fun thing in all of those chapters was there were several times where God calls out specific Israelites by name from specific tribes and says, this person in this tribe, I have skilled them to do this. I've skilled them to create this. I've skilled them to design this. I've skilled them to do this the way that I want. Not the priests, but just average everyday people. And... 
God wanted skilled workers to do the work. He didn't want like uh, good enough for government mentality. I don't know if there's any other fellow government employees in the house, but that's not what the Lord is looking for. He wanted the best of the best. And um, I, I might would say that his presence may not have rested in what they built if it was not built to the standard that he had told them. So, which, to pause there for a second, perhaps that's why the Lord allowed for us, for me, probably everyone else is already listening to the directions, but for me to begin to listen to the directions for what he has for our church. Um, the next instructions that the Lord gave for the tabernacle was for the design of the bronze altar. You want to pull that up, Josh? Exodus. Yeah, sorry, Josh. Jump to the verses. Exodus 27. Verse 1. I'm reading from the message. It says, Make an altar of acacia wood. Make it seven and a half feet square and four and a half, four and a half feet high. Make horns at each of the four corners. The horns are to be made of one piece with the altar and covered with a veneer of bronze. Make buckets for removing the ashes along with shovels, basins, forks, fire pans. Make these utensils from bronze. Make a grate of bronze mesh and attach bronze rings at each of the four corners. Put the grate under the ledge of the altar at the halfway point of the altar. Make acacia wood poles for the altar and cover them with a veneer of bronze. Insert the poles through the rings on the two sides of the altar for carrying. And use boards to make the altar, keeping the interior hollow. Now you can pull that picture back up, Josh. So essentially, this whole altar for the burning of sacrifices is really just an external structure that's hollow in the center. And we'll come back to that. Basically, God just wanted an empty vessel that would be available for continual sacrifice. The next instructions the Lord gave was how to create the courtyard, the garments, the jewelries, all the priest's clothes. Um, and of course, again, the Lord was very specific about that. I did want to read one verse because um, this has always stood out to me. But in Exodus 28, it's God is giving the instructions for the design of the clothes for the high, high priest. It says a gold bell... There you go. A gold bell and a pomegranate. A gold bell and a pomegranate. Round about the skirts on the robe, of the robe. Aaron shall wear the robe whenever he ministers, and its sound shall be heard when he goes alone into the Holy of Holies before the Lord, and when he comes out, lest he die there. So, if the high priest had not prepared himself in the way that he was supposed to, when he went into the holy place, the holy, the most holy place, he could die. And so even, I'm not, I don't have the verse here, but even they wrapped a cord around the high priest's leg in the event that he did die so they can pull him out. Because of course, if he's going to die, anyone else that goes in there would die too, trying to get him. But really all of these instructions and items were to create a space and a peoples and methods that would exhibit, exhibit the holiness of God. And there really is not an easy way to describe what holiness is because everything that we think of is something that's created or something of us or something like trying to be good enough type of mentality. But really, the Bible kind of defines holiness as being set apart. So if you look at the tabernacle, all these items that God was giving the instructions, they were to be unique, something that was set apart. And that was really to demonstrate again that God is holy. Is everybody still tracking with me today? Yes, some, yes, okay. It'll tie together better in the end, guys, I promise. Um, 
there was a boil water notice this week for some people in the Houston area. Not us. I mean, we have a well and a purification system at our house, so sorry if that was you. We were drinking our water with no problems. But, um, but we, does, does everybody like to drink clean water? Does anybody like to drink dirty water? Anyone? No? Okay. Um, this is pure water, or at least drinking water. Um, it's about three quarters full, so that's how much I've drank since we've been standing here, but if you were thirsty and there was no other water in the room, would, would this water suffice for you, even though I drank out of it? Yeah. Some people are, yeah, yeah. What if I filled the rest of it with water from the men's toilet? It's three quarters drinking water. Would anybody be willing to drink that? No. What if I, uh, what if I got just like a, an eardropper and I sucked up like a couple of drops of toilet water and I dropped it in here? Would you be willing to drink it? Is there anyone? One person's like, eh. Devin back there, he's saying no. <laughs> no, even one drop's too much. Okay. So it seems that for us here in the States, at least in Lake City, we have a standard of what our drinking water should be like, and that's appropriate because I've been to third world countries, and if you drink bad water, there's a bad outcome. So, but anyways, all right, so what if, what if I get the eardropper and take a couple of drops of pure water and drop it into the toilet water, would anyone drink that? No. If I do like a quarter of the bottle of pure water and I pour it into the toilet water, is that drinkable then? No. If I dump the whole bottle of pure water in there, is that drinkable? No. We like our water set apart from toilet water, the water we're drinking at least. <laughs> That's not the best description of what holiness is, but it's kind of getting you the thought of kind of how God thinks in relation to holiness. Sorry, that, all that came from the Lord. Like, I'm not funny. If, it, if, you're, if you're laughing, it's from him. Kind of to further explain this, Josh, if you can bring up the uh, picture of all the fish. Has anyone ever been to an Asian wet market? One, two, the Asians in the house, yes, we have. She has. Grace, I don't see your hand going up. Yep, she has. All right, so the Asians and the one white person over here have been to an Asian, Asian wet market. Can you pull up that picture? Oh, you don't have it? Ah, oh, man. Okay. Well, no, you, there's no way they can see that. She's like, just turn around your iPad. That's not going to work. So the photo that I had was all these dirty laundry baskets full of fish that were being sold. The first time that I ever saw a wet market, I was in Hong Kong. And my family friends that were from here and Houston as well, they lived in Hong Kong at the time, and they were really excited to take me to the wet market to see what I thought about it. And so we go, and the, you know, it's actually the street, the street with everybody selling is probably about as wide as the screen to the stage here, and there's just enough space in the middle, maybe for like, a couple of motorcycles to go go through and you've got all these dirty laundry baskets full of food sorry everybody that's from asia this is my western perspective of this but you have these dirty laundry baskets and plates that are like not sitting on tables they're sitting on the ground with the food you're gonna buy with vegetables all kinds of stuff like everything's all kind of mixed together and the ground was like it recently rained so there's like mud puddles kind of around all of the food and people's feet walking past all the items of food and I'm like, ugh. I didn't realize I had a standard for like food safety until I was there. And you know, there's like a motorcyclist driving by and all, you can see exhaust fumes like blowing all over the food. I'm like, ugh, this is gross. But the closest thing probably you can come to that here, no, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say, if you go to the Asian food store, sometime when you walk in there, it smells like death. But the cleanliness is about like that, too. Ah, uh, there's, there's my photo. Thank you. Yes. There's the dirty 
the dirty uh, laundry basket uh, imagery I was talking about. So again, I'm saying all this because just like we, at least here in the West, have a standard, God has a standard as well, and his standard is holiness. Do you have something? Okay. So anyways, so if we go back to the big picture again, Josh, sorry, I know you have to keep pulling, that, pulling this back up. So the... Really, the only place that, that people, the everyday person could come in was here, whenever they're bringing their, bringing their offering to God, and then the priest did everything else. So the priest sacrifices the animal, they wash themselves, I'll come back to that later, and then they are also the only ones that go into the dwelling place where the Lord is at. And, um, but even for the priests themselves, they had to be made holy and they would take, like, in the initial setting apart of themselves, the blood of the sacrifice had to be put on their ears and their thumbs and their toes, their big toes. And, um, again, I'm sure there's, like, some symbolism for all of that. I just, that could be explained. One, I don't have the time today. And two, I have not studied enough to know, but I'm sure you can find somebody. Let's jump to Exodus 30, verse 6. It says, You shall put the altar of incense. So the next item is the altar of incense. You shall put the altar of incense in front and outside the veil that screens the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, the laws, tables of stone, where I will meet with you. And Aaron shall burn incense on it, incense of sweet spices every morning. When he trims and fills the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron lights the lamps in the evening, he shall burn it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall offer no unholy incense on the altar, nor burnt sacrifice, nor cereal offering, and you shall pour no lib libation drink offering on it. So this altar was, only, was also set apart and meant for one thing. And really, it was set apart for a holy fragrance being rising in God's presence perpetually. I'm going to keep kind of speed through, guys. Um, the next item was that bronze laver. Josh, if you can pull that up. The bronze laver for washing. It was outside of the holy place. And those two things that were outside of the holy place were made of bronze. Everything else, again, on the inside was made of gold. Um, and the priests were instructed to wash their hands and their feet from it. Um, again, lest they die. Um, and I'll skip past my verses that talk about that just for time's sake. But God wanted their hands clean for what they were going to touch in the holy place, and he wanted their feet clean for where they were going. God also gave directions on how to make the holy anointing oil for the priests, for the incense. He indicated that the prescribed formulas of all of this were only to be used in the holy setting using these items outside of the holy setting had, you didn't die actually, you were just excommunicated from everyone. Because God did not want to mix what was holy with what was not set apart. So essentially, there is, in the Old Testament, for them to be able to encounter the presence of God, there was a lot of work. A lot of work. Um, they had uh, the structure, the furnishings, the clothing, the linens, the oils, the scents. They all had to be created and assembled. Sacrifices had to be identified and acquired and then brought to the priest. Then the priest had to perform all these rituals for the animal sacrifices, and they had to wash their hands and their feet. They had to wear special clothing in the holy place. They had to eat this special bread at a special time. They had to continually burn this incense and... Make sure the flames were lit on the lampstand. The high priest had to risk his life um, to enter the Holy of Holies to present the blood sacrifices. And then came Jesus. Can anyone say amen? So we don't got to do all that anymore. So he became that perfect and final sacrifice for all of us. 
and we no longer have to do all that work to access the presence of God. No longer is it one holy person that gets to go face to face with the Lord, but it's all of us. All of us are given that access. Matthew 25, verse 50 says, And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And at once the curtain of the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. So when Jesus died, the veil in the temple that separated the place where only the high priest could go and even the priests, the everyday person couldn't go into the holy place. It was just the priest. Um, that veil was torn. And so it's believed that veil was four inches thick of fabric. That'd be like maybe a little bigger than your seat cushion, trying to tear that in half, huge veil. And God's the one that did that. So, again, Christ's, opportunity, or Christ's sacrifice provides us the opportunity for each of us to enter the presence of God. Um, the Lord says, however, that while he's granted us this access as his church, he says that we're not taking advantage of this enough. He says that we are... Uh, taking it more for granted than we are taking advantage of it. And he says that we have given ear to the religious voice in our minds. There's, there's still a, Josh, if you pull up that picture again. The enemy wants us to believe that there is a lot of work to get into the presence of the Lord. He wants us to believe that, that yeah, we sinned and we screwed up, and so we, we got to do something to make ourselves clean, really not even to get into the presence of the Lord, but just to be okay with the Lord, to be in a right relationship with Him. And what the Lord is saying for us is that it's from His presence where... Hmm. I'll come back to that in a minute. Let me read a couple more verses. Hebrews 4, verse 14 says, Since then we have a great high, high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in, in, to help in our time of need. So, God's saying today to us that he's reversed the order of worship. And I'm going to Try to go through this very quickly. He's reversed the order of worship. In the old way, you had to, you had to have a sacrifice. You, the priests had to be cleaned. You, they had all these different steps of things that they had to do in order to go to the, to go to the, the holiest place, into the presence of God. First Peter 1 says, But as the one who called you is holy, you, you, you yourselves... Also be holy in your conduct and manner of living. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So, let me go back to the picture again. Sorry, Josh. So this is the old way. This was the path. And what, God is, what, what God is telling us as his church today is I want everything for you to start in my presence. Everything. He says, this is, this is where worship begins, not, not trying to find your sacrifice to be prepared, but going directly into the throne room of God and seeing him face to face. He says, as you, as you come in this reverse order, being in my presence will cause for you to become the perpetual fragrance that flows up in worship to him. Leave that, leave that picture up for me, Josh. 
Second Corinthians. Oh, sorry, Josh. <laughs> Second Corinthians 14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumph as trophies of Christ's victory, and through us spreads and makes evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. For we are the sweet fragrance of Christ, which inhales unto God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the latter, it's an aroma of death to death, a fatal odor, a smell of doom. To the former, it's an aroma of life to life, a vital fragrance, living and fresh. And who is qualified for these things? Who is able for such a ministry? We. Hmm. Amen. So, yeah, thanks, Josh. So now you become the fragrance of Christ to God. The bread, again, was an image of, of Jesus' life. And I'm skipping through this really quick, guys. And the lampstand was the aspect of the Holy Spirit. So the being in the Father's presence, becoming a sweet fragrance to him, um, allowing God to bring revelation in your life as to who he is, who Jesus is, who you are, and then coming out here in this, in this place, God is the one that cleanses us from our sins, not us. And I'm going to stop there. Sorry, Josh. Just running back and forth through all this. In John 6, verse 33, Jesus speaking, he says, For the bread of God is he who comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always, all the time. And Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. In Matthew 5, Jesus is speaking again. He says, here is another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. This is from the message. God is not a secret to be kept. He says, we're going public with this, as public as a city on the hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? He says, I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that... I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. He says, keep open house, be generous with your lives by opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God, this gener generous Father in heaven. So as we prepare to enter the world, he cleanses us, then he calls us. Um, Hmm. And that, re that religious mindset still has it backwards in that we think that we have to clean ourselves and make a sacrifice for us to enter the presence. But the Father says it's the presence of the Lord that we are cleansed and become the sacrifice. One more time, Josh, I think. I think this is my last time to have you pull that up. So this, again, this, this altar was a hollow, a hollow structure for continual sacrifices. And the Lord's saying that from his presence, all these other things are happening, but the last place before he sends us out into the world is to become the altar. Our, our body, our person, is the hollow altar for continual sacrifices, and our life is the continual sacrifice that is a worship unto him. Romans 12 Twelve one says, and the Amplified, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your mem members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Kindle and worship, folks. I like how it said it in the, in the message as well, Josh, if you'll bring that one up. Paul's saying, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. 
embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you, and sets us apart. Hello. Do you want me to share? <laughs> I just sense that what the Lord wants me to share today is what it's like to be in His presence. So, in, just like um, what Danik shared about in the tabernacle, like the oils there are being changed every day. It's like, for us, you find, I find myself even like at this point, like, I, so there was a time when I was uh, like younger, and my dream was to have, to marry a godly man and homeschool my kids, like, because I was looking at our pastor, oh, that's the one I want. And like, and so like in my thinking, like, you know, like that's what, but now I find myself that I'm in here, but you know, like there are places in our hearts that only like, I had a mentor before that always tells me like, Jackie, if you, even if you marry the most godly man, only God can feel that space in your heart. You know what I mean? And it's true. And sometimes we find ourselves in that situation. I heard a pastor said that the season we're in is somebody's prayer request. You know, like if I wake up a couple of times last night because of my children, like somebody's prayer request is their children come out of coma. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's always something. But these things in our everyday lives ushers us to come to God's presence. Because when we come, like... Like Sharon shared, that's true. It's so hard to go there. Like your flesh resists it. You're so distracted with the everyday things. But once you go there, you don't want to get out. Like the God's presence just changes you. Like it, it propels you to want to, um, it purifies your heart. It really transforms you, set you apart. It gives you a heart of love that you're like on your own flesh, you're not capable to love. And it sustains you, and it fills you, like. And so I would just encourage you that. And I sense the Lord just want me to encourage my experience with His presence, and um, the presence of God. The first time I've ever felt God in my flesh was I was in mission school. We were just worshiping, and the presence of God hit me, and like I felt like an elephant stepped on me. It's like the presence of God is the His glory is so heavy, and um, I sensed the worship was over, but I cannot get up. By the time I got up, nobody's in, nobody's there anymore. They're all eating in the hall. So when I went there to see my classmates, the first thing I asked them was like. Why didn't you tell me God is real? Because like when you encounter his presence, it's like, it's so like, it changes you. Like he's real. And you know, it's available for us every day to encounter him. Like there's places in us that are hungry, that like he wants to feel that every day. And like those places in us that's confused, like sometimes like, you know, like Danik and I, why we haven't, we're not there. Like, you know, every day we need Christ too. And like every day we also um, have the invitation to come to him. Like sometimes I find myself, how hard it is to raise kids. Like, <laughs> but, but like, you know, it ushers me to God's presence. So I just wanted to encourage everyone. Yeah. Yeah, amen. I just want to finish with the story today. Um, Jackie and I have gone to the Philippines. Well, she's gone many times. That's where she's from. But I've gone four times now. One of the times we were going back, we were getting our pasalubong grace for the other Filipino in the house, which is basically gifts. So whenever you're married to a Filipino or you are a Filipino, there's an extra item on your budget that you have to plan for that most people probably don't plan for, and that is, if you're coming from here, you gotta buy gifts for everybody to take them there. And once you're there, you gotta buy gifts for everybody that's back home and bring them back. So, if you're not Filipino, you want, to, you want that tradition for yourself, you could do it, but otherwise you're just gonna save some money. Um, but my father-in-law loves American sports teams hats and so when do we go that's where we get them and so one of the times we went jackie and i went to lids which 
maybe for the old people, it's a store in the mall, that that's what their specialty is, is hats of like sports teams from the United States. And um, we're there, and in this moment, I'm, I'm not like, the Lord's probably speaking to me, but I'm not paying attention to the Lord. And Jackie is, and she says, after we pay, she's like, hey, I want to pray for this girl that, that works here. I said, sure. Go ask her, see if she wants to pray. And so Jackie walks up. She goes over to the girl. She's like, hey, can we pray for you? And the girl just quickly responds, no. I said, all right, Jackie, let's go. And the girl chases us out the door. And she says, hey, wait. She says, I do want you to pray for me. And she's like, I, nobody's ever asked me that, so it just caught me off guard. And uh, so we prayed for her, and after we prayed with her and prophesied over her and ministered to her, she's like, when are you going to come back? And I say that because... The enemy wants us to, he wants us to be focused on, on the old method. Because in the old method, there is no imp impact on anyone else's life. You're focused on yourself. You're focused on how dirty you are and what you got to do to clean yourself up. But in the, in the reverse order, the reverse order of worship, every day, every moment, God wants us to encounter Him in a tangible way. Everything in our life, He wants it to come from our face-to-face -face with Him. But in our culture, really, the image of, of that altar and that hollow, that hollow altar for the living sacrifice, it really is a sacrifice for us, our life. Because everybody, everybody's always thinking like, what is, what is everybody else thinking of me? What are they thinking of what I'm going to, what I'm doing, what I'm saying, how I'm, how I'm behaving, like if I do this, if God tells me to do something and I, I go ask this, this girl at the mall, like, hey, can I pray for you? Like, maybe she'll say no. Well, she did say no, that she said yes. But what will other people think of me? And that, that, Taking that risk is the is the sacrifice that's God call, that God is calling us to. Because there's a whole world of people that they may not even know who God is or that He exists. They may not know Jesus. And the way that people in the world that don't know Jesus are going to encounter Him is through us. And yeah, God can do other things too, but he's called us to bring the presence out to the world.